Hello, my name is Ed Barrett, and I direct the William Corbett Poetry Series at MIT, sponsored by the Comparative Media Studies and Writing Program at MIT. And tonight, we are here to happily celebrate a new anthology of poems by six current and former MIT women students entitled, Our Ancestors Did Not Breathe This Air. Our guest host for this evening is Indran Amirthana Yagam. Indran is a multilingual poet, essayist, translator, author of over 20 books of poetry, and editor of the Beltway Poetry Quarterly. Uh, Indran worked with the six poets you will hear tonight as they put together the anthology of their poems, which we're very, very happily celebrating. Uh, Indran, welcome, and I will now turn the screen and the evening over to you and the readers. Thank you so much. What an honor and a pleasure it is tonight and, and a thrill um, to introduce these poets. Uh, you know, this is a, a much loved book uh, and it's about to appear. Um, it's a first book. Uh, you know, this evening is a first on many levels. I mean, the first time these poets from MIT will read together on literally a, a world stage through this Zoom platform. It's the first time that Beltway Editions will publish a book of poems, our first book. So we're thrilled, uh, Sarah K. Hilbaron and I, the co-publishers of Beltway. It's the first time also that I have the pleasure to present um, really some of my favorite new poets uh, in America. And, and as a migrant, also to these to this country, thrilled also again to celebrate this welcome addition to the poetry of migration. Um, I wrote this small poem uh, some weeks ago uh, when the the dummy for the book arrived. It's called "To the Poets of Our Ancestors Did Not Breathe This Air" from their publisher. This pivot into publishing is pure pleasure pirouette, satisfaction limitless and roaring in the book fair marketplace, going head to heel against the marketing team of the beer moth as we, the small press, Beltway editions arm ourselves with a potent book of charged lyric poetry written by six young women who believe still in honor and truth while we snort and snarl and believe too, as if for the first time in verses that will make all the difference in lives of men and women, not only at funerals, not only during moments of melancholy before the mountain of debt, of uncertain resolutions, but just shift the mountain with breath, felicitous melody. Listen to the chanting, Listen to the charming, committed voices of these youth. They wake up hope. They unleash the song in waves and waves. And this show, this air, will never again be ignorant of their breath, blowing here now, infusing the lines, these united states. Um, welcome. Welcome to this very special evening. Um, there are six poets, uh, which is a lucky number, multiplication of three. And the first who will read tonight, a uh, very special uh, role she has played in this book, not only writing her poems and contributing to the dialogue with all the others, but also contributing some amazing designs, which you will see uh, when you get the book. Um, Afifa Kazi Saeed was born and raised in the DFW, that's Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, but has always called two places home, the suburbs of Texas and her grandparents' home in Southern India. After studying biological engineering with a minor in urban studies at MIT, the FIFA finds herself on a new journey as a first year medical student at UT Southwestern. She attributes her love for writing and storytelling to her grandparents' bedtime stories and the many writing mentors she has found throughout her life, from high school English teachers to other immigrant writers. Afifa views poetry as a deeply personal exchange of experiences and stories. Please go ahead, Afifa. 
Kazi Saeed. Welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Indran. It's been such an honor for all of us to be working with you and Sarah, and also just writing in the same era and space as you. So it's really our honor. I have two poems uh, for you all today, um, and I'll go right in. So the first one is called Parachute. Every time I settle at your feet with a bowl of coconut oil in hand, swirled and warmed for exactly 15 seconds in the microwave, I feel generations. The hands of each and every one of them must have also moved like yours, working through knots of carelessness and exhaustion. The wrinkles on your fingers must have been passed down through hidden battles I will never know of, and this massage routine must have grown in perfection through centuries of ummies and nannies and daddies. When you neatly fold my hair into your signature braid, something tells me these words have been said before. When will you start taking care of yourself? I answer by asking you the same. So for this poem, um, something that's really common in Indian cultural or South Asian culture is hair oil massages. One, it's really good for your hair health, um, but it's also just a way for mothers and daughters and sisters to come together, let their hair loose and you know just pamper each other um, and really focus on each other's company. Um, and so really this poem is a note to that tradition and to my mother and my grandmothers and the mothers that came before that. So I will now read my second poem titled Dear Kashmir. You and I, we are not that different. The color of our skin traverses across the same paint palette at Home Depot, October sky to dark camel and every shade that falls in between. You wake up to the warmth of sunshine. I wake up to the warmth of sunshine, but yours fights through the Kunlun mountains and mine through the Boston skyline. We both know the smell of the air just before it's about to snow. But you know other smells too, of sweaty crowds chanting in the streets, of mortal shells dissolving into thin air, of flesh losing its meaning beyond this nationless land. In the moments before I go to sleep at night, the breeze of my ceiling fan reminds me of my Anda grandmother and the coolness of her morning terrace. Somewhere in the middle of the night, it hits me that I have such fond memories of a place that takes away yours. It leaves me with nightmares of patterns of electric fences striped borders so held up on the you and I, they forget Azadi is what keeps us alive. I am suspended in the paradox of my homeland. The sun sends to you its warmth from 92.96 million miles away. We have forgotten to do the same from a stone's throw away. And so that poem is really an ode to the Kashmiri people whose culture and tradition um, and entity is often shadowed by the ongoing conflict for the region between India and China and Pakistan. Um, and so it's just really recentering that Kashmiri identity. That's all I have, thank you. Bravo, thank you. Thank you so much, Afisha. And, uh, it is good to know that the to know the conflicts that are taking place on the planet, you know, not only, uh, I mean, all over, and uh, we need to know and be reminded uh, of the things that we have to, to work on and correct. Alina Shabir was born in Queens, New York, and has lived in New York ever since. As a Pakistani US American, she cherishes connecting with a multitude of cultures in addition to her own roots. Many years after the minor poetry lessons she had taken in elementary school, Alina found a community with these fellow poets who have taught her how to express herself creatively and comfortably. She is forever grateful for them and their care. Having studied data science, and operations research in different fields of applied mathematics, Alina hopes to one day work in policy development with a quantitative background. Alina usually enjoys reading anything to do with nature, traveling, and pursuing adrenaline-inducing experiences. And I would add, and writing marvelous poems. Go ahead, Alina. Thank you very much, Indran. And thank you very much, Afifa, for reading your poems. Um, just to touch on Afifa's poem, I think that it's a testament to this natural compassion and good heartedness that we as humans have. 
and can feel. And that is such a uniting force that allows us to stand up against like different oppressive uh, things around us, regardless of how we identify or what nationalities we may have. And I would just like to say like may Kashmir and all uh, countries who are undergoing similar struggles be free from these limited and binding forces and be able and have its citizens be able to live freely and happily. Um, so I would like to read two, uh, two poems. My first poem called um, is 2009. And this was a poem that was inspired by my first uh, experience in like a summer camp that opened up my eyes to a whole bunch of different things. Uh, whether it be friendship or creativity, I just found it um, to be one of uh, the most inspiring times in my life. So uh, 2009, 9.30 to 11 a.m., art house. I miss the simplicity of these times, the abundance of laughter, endless smiles and sunshine, the small shed filled to the brim with paint and clay, tables and kilns scattered, drinking gallons of juice every morning as motivation to finish our pottery. Music from the radio numbing our thoughts, the camaraderie, our special glue. 11 a.m. to 12.30, Franklin's Field. When I smash the dodgeball in your face during all sports, we always take ourselves far too seriously and dump coolers of water onto the losing team, jumping to heights we didn't know existed. 1.30 to 3 p.m., computer lab. How about a break from the outdoors? Something a little more tame. Just kidding. Nerdy kids thirsting for a Pulitzer. Writing our own stories and reports. Weekly editions of our own little fun. 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Room 416. Always saving the best for last, right? How could I forget about you? Surrounded by teenage testosterone. The only girl for three weeks. Building robots that come to life soldering friendship through metal and care. August 11th, August 11th, my heart. Not a goodbye, but a see you later. I never felt yearning like that before. Marking my calendar for the next year, praying for a quick trip around the sun. And the next poem that I would like to share is called Live Thoughts As I'm Skydiving. Um, and this poem is kind of a, uh, kind of like a streamline of my direct thoughts uh the very first time I went skydiving which was um very funnily enough in Switzerland where Indran is right now so I'm very slightly jealous um life thoughts as I'm skydiving I love the adrenaline the thrill of adventure coursing inside scared out of my mind I'm all over the place impulsive decisions are my strongest vice up until I'm actually out of my comfort zone arms filling deeply sinking, the wind whipping in my face, the lakes beneath me, blue, so beautifully different from the skies. I never imagined I'd find it so ugly from up here. I hate this while I'm having the time of my life. Talk about a panorama, but did I just swallow a fly? Time seems more meaningful up here. I feel like I'm looking at a board game, everything a 10th of its size. We get closer, the distance between is smaller, but my fear, more real. What looks so tiny, now giant, daunting. I push my legs out, ready to come back, and it's the ass landing that grounds me again. And I'm thankful to the sky. I see things differently now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, before we uh, go to our next point, I just want to read you a few comments people have sent in about this book. Nehan Shujat writes, a timeless collection that tells the story of all. I find myself reading our ancestors did not breathe this air any time I want to feel connected with my ancestors and myself. Sahib so Webb, who is the resident scholar of the Islamic Center at NYU writes, through a rich journey of thought and ideas, each poet captures highly personal imagery that none of us can afford to ignore. I strongly encourage the reading and studying of this vital work. And Professor Sana Ayer, who wrote Indians in Kenya, the Politics of Diaspora, adds a moving collection 
from a new generation of young Muslim women who bring not only a fresh voice to these issues, but a poignancy that is both lyrical and urgent. This is a community enterprise, and the next poet, besides being an excellent lyricist, and is, uh, was, is also a speaker of Spanish, and the book designer for Beltway, Jorge Reta Sandoval, uh, she served as a bridge on some of the, the Zoom conversations as, as, the, as the design was being developed. So thank you for that. I say Angela Gavenilia was born in Austin into a family with a Turkish father, a Venezuelan mother, and three older brothers. Growing up in Texas, France, and various parts of upstate New York, I see as always use reading and writing for connection, reflection, and relaxation as she moved from place to place. She sees poetry in particular as a form of writing that can surpass the bounds of what words are expected to be, in turn connecting her with others. Icy got her bachelor's degree in biological engineering with a minor in creative writing from MIT and is currently a master's student in the biomechatronics group at the MIT Media Lab. Through her work, Icy aims to emphasize, empathize, educate, and inspire the way that the works of others have always done for her. Please go ahead, Icy. Thank, thank you so much, and John, for that lovely introduction. And um, before I go on and talk a little, say two of my own poems, I wanted to comment a little bit on Alina's. And I just wanted to say that I love how 2009 really takes me back to childhood summers. And I also love how Life, got, life Thoughts while I'm skydiving always reminds me to have perspective. And it also gives me a little bit of a laugh. So. That's, that's always great as well. So the first poem that I'm gonna read from the collection is called A Sampling of My Favorite Lullaby. I'm just gonna jump right in. A Sampling of My Favorite Lullaby. Knowing my Fatiha and ABCs, tracing them in a book you drew for me. Los pojitos dicen, looking for you through the cafeteria doors to plant a lipstick kiss on the cheek I would not wipe away. Pio, pio, pio. Scooting my way into the uprooted sidewalk, you helped me limp home. Cuando tienen hambre, missing almost every half day Saturday in Montbono because you let us. Cuando tienen frío, struggling with an essay in fourth grade, you said, write, 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 and figure out the rest later. Su mamá le busca el maíz el trigo. Even with yours needing help limping to the bathroom, you took me a soccer. Les da la comida y les presta el brigo. Getting me a present whenever it was someone else's birthday. Acucaraditos bajo sus dos alas. Cooking my friends turkey meals. My favorite part, the way you made the stuffing with the spinach and strawberries. Duermen los pojitos. Changing the emphasis from me to yours and I'm not there to lift your load. Hasta el otro día, I'm sorry. So for this poem, the parts that I sang uh, and were in Spanish are actually from uh, this po a Chilean poet, is Ismael Paragues, um, and it's from a book that was first published in 1907 um, called Poesias Infantiles, which is basically just a, a like ch children's nursery rhymes and but the way that I knew it growing up was my mom would often sing it to me as a lullaby and it's one of the first lullabies I remember ever hearing. Uh, the second poem I want to share is uh, called Dear My Favorite Memories and maybe those from MIT maybe some things will uh, you'll relate to a little bit. Dear My Favorite Memories, jumping onto the car roof because you are not walking home in the cold from this restaurant 
where I only had goldfish. And for some reason, it's a problem that I supposedly never finish my food. In fact, it's funny to you say I care about your day and I do. And I'm touched that it touches you see me from across the room and you scoot your way over. And I haven't a clue about this lab report. We put our sweaters on backwards. So at least we're warming up this room with book clubs and 320 struggles that you got me through the night when I just wanted this presentation prep to end. I'm singing down the hallways where you find me always. The warmth you feel radiating from me really comes from all of you. Don't you see formulation and catalyzation that night across the Charles? You talked about building while flying. I didn't know you appreciated the first time we met. I thought you thought I was annoying. Essays were in while making out a fuss. You kept me company. Reminiscing memories do mean so much to me. I don't know how to process. So you put on headphones over your earbuds as you backed out of the room. I'm laughing at the singular mango party of four. Isn't it obvious that I too am Muslim like you see me as a mentor? I'm just lucky getting to love all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I wish we could, we could hear more than two poems from each of you. I mean, I'm, it's a very touching uh, thing, you know, uh, this, uh, this evening. And uh, thank you for, for sharing your work. I, my next poet, uh, Maisha Munawara Prome, um, you know, has also written some very strong poems in this book. I was really struck by her poem, Rice. I don't know if she's going to be reading that, but it's just each of these poems, you know, there's a, can be read on, on different levels. You read as, as testament, as, as lyrical sort of inquiry from the, from the heart, but it can also be read as a social statement, a political reading of the world. And uh, I think that's one of the, the treasures that you'll discover when you read this, these poems. Maisha Munawara Promi was born in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and has moved back and forth between Bangladesh and the United States throughout her life. Maisha used to write poetry as a child growing up in New York City but rediscovered it in college while taking classes from her writing minor. Aside from poetry, Maisha enjoys all things creative, from baking to crocheting to writing fiction. She, oh dear, I hope you, we don't lose her to fiction one day. I think you can write both fiction and poetry though. She has won awards for her short stories and hopes to continue writing alongside working in research and education. Maisha graduated from MIT with a bachelor's degree in biological engineering. She is currently pursuing her PhD in biological sciences at Yale University. Go ahead, Maisha. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Indran. Um, yeah, and Aisha, your last poem, um, I have to say, is one of my favorites in the whole entire book. And it's just so many beautiful memories strung together into a single poem. And I feel like all of us um, have a version of this poem based on our own experiences somewhere inside our hearts. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm also going to read two poems today. And the first one is called Since the Day I Arrived. And it's about the first day I moved into MIT as a freshman. A sunny new day, a paint splash sky, a trunk pack full, a four year supply. A scarf just as blue covers my face as I cry. I've mourned the day I would leave since the day I arrived. A twin stacked building, a bright green lawn, a never ending hallway, a September song, a promise of growth in the four years to come, when the car pulls away, it leaves me somewhere I finally belong. My second poem um, is called A Thousand Places. Um, and I've moved uh, a lot in my life. And this is just an ode to all the different places I've called home. Yellow earth between my toes, chasing chickens through the yard. The slip on mosaic tile before, the crash and the permanent scar. A strip of airplane carpet, miles above the gleaming sea. 
gritty grayness of the schoolyard scraping raw against my knee. Polished floor of marble tile like ice in the winter chill. Dorm room carpet brown and warm with the history undistilled. Treading through pearlescent snow and through monsoon flooded streets, I've walked a thousand places and found home beneath my feet. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now will hear from Mariam Eman Dogar. Mariam was born in Singapore and has lived in Dubai and Massachusetts, moving every few years. She describes the closest things to home as the intangible bridge she and her siblings occupy between the very different countries cultures and families of her US American mother and Pakistani father. Mariam has loved writing since elementary school, creating fictional worlds and characters on the back of her notebooks. However, she started writing poetry during her time as a biology major and urban planning minor at MIT. Poetry is now deeply connected to self-care and spirituality for Mariam, while she is training to be a physician at Harvard Medical School. And, and you know, I there are so many lovely poems here. I don't want to pick anyone. I'll just, just sit back and listen. But I, I just want to say uh, another sort of theme throughout this book is, is the choice of language and, and uh, all the languages that we carry with us and, and how we are seen uh, as we use our languages. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Indran. And before I begin, I also just want to say a few words about Maisha's poems. Um, so I think Maisha's superpower is being able to use maybe three, four words to be able to describe a scene that you would imagine took maybe three sentences, four sentences. Um, she she really packs the punch, and I think that you know people, as you can see in the comments, are resonating with with your poems, Maisha. Today, I'll also be reading two poems. Um, the first one is called Tangerine. Lately, I've been starting to feel my soul instead of my body. Like that day on the beach with the rocks and the sunset. Footsteps so faint, I could almost levitate. With the horizon speaking into my ear, be content. Or when I sat at the dinner table in the center of the forest, a citrus spread and the smell of durian between us, when he leaned forward and whispered that he could feel his ancestors in the air. Or when I pass a tiger lily and feel a touch on my arm, tracing the outline of the last day she could stand upright. When we walked in the garden and I painted her toes, a bright orange that decorated her feet on her deathbed. Or when my knees knock against a stranger's and I remember us in the back of a sedan with a broken AC, sharing secrets for hours in the delirious glow of the desert, giving me inconvertible proof that you did exist. See, I've come to the conclusion that I'm not quite literal. I am memories transcribed without my knowledge, like the passive rise and fall of my chest or the tears that slip from my eyes when I laugh. In this brilliant orchestra, I collect these moments, undeniably alive and imperfect and sentient. I am congruent with the hearts I've met before and those he bids me to meet again. So just a few words about this poem. Um, hopefully when you, when you read our book, you'll see that each chapter, we all give our take on, uh, on a certain prompt and, and the prompt for this chapter was on being real. And I remember being very confused. <laughs> what does that even mean? And I think what, how I interpreted it was thinking about what not being real is and what the people that I've had in my life that are no longer physically in front of me um, have meant to me. And yeah, that, that is sort of how 
um, that poem came about. And then for my next poem, um, it is called period, but the actual punctuation mark of a period. You woke to a surprise on your bed, pure white sheets stained rusted red. They said it was normal, nothing to fear, but the sight of your blood kept feeding the tears. You cried for what you couldn't know, but felt. You grieved the innocence that you'd once held. You lost a childhood of skirts and shorts. They now controlled your body parts. The next month, your world turned crimson again. Coach said, wear tampons like other women. At home, you Googled what tampon means when you closed the laptop and quit swim team. Your accidents were public with family and strangers. They'll never forget the whispers and fingers. You prayed for the pain the others talked about so that next time you could catch yourself before spilling out. One month, you're ambushed by two visits. You then leave the masjid entirely to avoid the critics. Sometimes your brother would throw a fit. He's mad when you aren't praying, and he is. It would be simple to explain to him why, but the thought makes you feel small. Instead, you hide. At school, at school you learn about the menstrual cycle. When you hear them in the back, periods make girls go psycho. As the days pass, they always have more to say about what you wear and how you pray, who you should touch and for how long, where you should travel and why you're not strong. To you, I say, a woman is not a sin. You're a miracle sister. You've always been. You bleed and heal as you sprint through life. Your sole purpose, I promise, is not to be a good wife. You carry them in your belly and upon your tongue, heavy on your shoulders and deep inside your lungs. You are in scripted power, my dear, and we won't forget it. Thank you so much. Mahwa Abdullahi was born in Chennai, India, and has called many places home across the US and in Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. She completed her bachelor's and master's studies in computer science at MIT and is currently pursuing a PhD in robotics and artificial intelligence at the University of California in Berkeley. She is drawn to poetry for its oral tradition and grew up hearing her dada Saab recite the works of Muhammad Iqbal and Jalal ad-Din, Muhammad Rubi in their home in South India. Performing, writing, and listening to poetry allows her to connect with God and understand existence. It is her form of dawah to herself and the world. Mawa Abdullahi. Thank you, Inran. And the first. Thank you. Um, before I begin, <clears throat> I'd also like to comment um, on Miriam's poem. Uh, and there's so much to say. It's so little time. But for me, Tangerine, it's, you know, the the title is so, is so misleading. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it really packs so much. It's a breath of fresh air and, and so much more. And then no matter how many times I hear the poem, period, I feel a mix of anger and, and empowerment. And I am so grateful that you touched on such a taboo topic. Um, and, and it makes our, our collection all the more powerful. Um, and with that, uh, I'll start off with my, my first poem. Um, and it is about my experiences taking part in interfaith dialogue at MIT, um, known as a deer, uh, which some of you might be familiar with the group. So it is titled, uh, When in Dialogue. A Mormon, a Muslim, and a Hindu sat at the corners of a rounded table, chatting away on the weather and business of the day. They had gathered to discuss truth. As their souls watched behind happy eyes, afraid to speak on their creation and existence. They spoke of intentions before conversation, gathering questions they sought to understand. They were equal partners in search for a reason, for surely, if God willed, God would make them one community. The Mormon spoke of her mission abroad 
peace found in disconnecting from the world. The Muslim felt a sense of holy envy. He wished he was more vocal about his faith. The Muslim shared stories of perseverance of the last prophet, raising the importance of giving to zakat in his faith. He finally felt comfortable stepping away for Zuhr Salah. The Hindu admitted she could be spending more time in prayer. The Hindu believed in many chances at life. She held respect for her parents above all else, yet confessed she wasn't always so sure of certain traditions. The Mormon expressed she empathized, though she couldn't always voice it. And so the Mormon, the Muslim, and the Hindu discussed ideas and not people in mutual understanding of their differences, leaving with what was learned and not spoken. And now my next poem um, is reflecting on being an immigrant from India and later becoming a US citizen and living with all the ways in which I am. So it's called A Citizenship. You step outside when a gush of spice hits the air and you and your nose. It's embedded deep within the fabrics of your jacket. The Tide detergent never seems to mask the smells of homeland you are so ashamed of. They ask you why you smell like spice and why your food has so much pepper. But Vasco da Gama didn't go to India to get pepper. He went to get the haldi in sambar and chicken jalfrezi and the zira in the butter chicken you have when you think you've experienced India. You shrug in response. Abba told you that you are now an American. I remember the time I became a citizen of this country. Age 10, two-piece hijab removed for a passport photo. Shame knowing you didn't fight for your right to dignity. Shame knowing your mother and sisters did the same. You knew in that moment when you in your two-piece scarf ran through the aisles of Costco with your money in her shiny her mother in her shiny and new black abaya, they stared. And now you speak in the language of your colonizers from 1858. It would only be years later when you were gifted the power of the pen to acknowledge the seams in the fabrics of your jacket. Thank you. Well, there you have it, a sampler just two poems from each of six poets. There are many more in the book, and each one uh, very, very, very charged. As I mentioned earlier, it can be read on so many levels, apparently simple lines uh, with very deep, profound, right, uh, sort of feelings and thoughts embedded inside. I'm lost track of time, but if there are any questions from the audience, I think we have a few minutes. We can take a couple of, of, of any of the poets. Please uh, leave your question in the chat. And uh, please do, uh, let us know if you'd like to, um, or if you'd like to ask the question directly, uh, perhaps uh, the mics can be, opened for everyone in the uh, in the zoom a lot of appreciations in the chat but um, for any particular question here's a chance it won't be the first opportunity I trust this this group will be will be uh, going on the road in a sense as one does in America with, with a new album I, or if if not on the road through the Zoom, the, the Zoom room. Um, so I think there's an in-person reading coming up in May, I just found out about. Um, as a question for us, uh, could you share the name of the Chilean children's book of poems? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. called Poesias Infantiles. I will also send the name of the author and the, in, in the chat now as well. Good question.
Are there other questions? Thank you, Mark, for the very generous and thoughtful remarks. Mark Pollock, a former MIT and MIT graduate, poetry student at MIT. So there's a lot of learning poetry and practicing poetry at MIT. And, and these six poets are the latest uh, in, in, the, in that line. The latest poets in that line. Any other questions for, for them? Um, if not, I just want to say uh, look for beltwayeditions.com online or look for the, um, the Instagram page for Beltway or for our ancestors to not breathe this air. Um, and and uh, come and, and pick up the book. Uh, it'll be it'll be out soon, and, and soon it'll be available also in bookstores and Amazon. But we're waiting for the first copies to be sent from the printer as we speak. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, would any of the poets like to say some closing remarks or? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank Ed. Um, a lot of us, our common thread <laughs> was taking your class at MIT and just realizing that this was something we also like to do in addition to, to all of our other identities and responsibilities, um, just creating the space for this in the first place. And um, I know we're all very grateful for all of your help and feedback throughout the entire process. Yes, it takes a village and uh, you're a very important part of that village. So thank you. Thank you for, for encouraging and inspiring these poets to, to take this path. And, um, so it, it, it really, it's just an amazing thing. It's we're, we're waiting for the birth of the child. The child is almost here. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, and uh, let's look forward to the next reading there. The official launch of the book will be on, I think it's May 7th. Um, so start to spread that word, put that word in, in that date in your calendars. Um, and, uh, and let's meet again soon. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, thank you.